This Viewfinder episode is supported by UC Davis Health System. At UC Davis, the lives we touch inspire us. Free flight's the oldest kind of model airplane competition. The idea is to do with how long the airplane stays up in the air. We've got people from probably 15 or 16 different countries. I'm from Australia, actually Brisbane, but I do think that this is probably one of the best flying fields in the world. Ready? It's a good one. Malcolm Campbell says this dusty spot, 40 miles northwest of Bakersfield, is the perfect place for their annual world championship competition. But as he and his other model aircraft aficionados discovered, it's also a place that could potentially severely threaten their health. The field is filled with the fungal spores that cause valley fever. Nice little walk in the park. <laughs> I came here first in 2011, it was green and lovely. But then we turned up in 2012 and it was quite dusty. Malcolm flew his model plane and took photos of the competition. Three weeks later, the symptoms hit. So it was shivers, shakes, coughs, really awful feeling, high temperatures, and um, sore lungs. Malcolm had caught valley fever, technically known as coccidiomycosis, named after the spores Malcolm inhaled while in Lost Hills. California and Arizona are the primary states where the fungus coccidioides is found. The fungus grows when the soil is wet and breaks apart in dry conditions. The microscopic spores blow around in the dust. And if you breathe the wrong cupful of air, it can impact in your lung and set up housekeeping and it changes into a little golf ball looking affair and that thing grows like crazy. It's estimated that 150,000 people in the U.S. get valley fever and nearly 200 people will die from it each year. Reported cases have skyrocketed 700% since 1998. Surprisingly, experts say 60% of people infected with valley fever won't ever know they had it. About 40% end up with flu-like symptoms like Malcolm. People from areas outside the endemic regions are particularly susceptible. So you might say, well, it's kind of similar to other kinds of pneumonia. But it is a particularly difficult kind of pneumonia because it leaves the person exhausted, fatigued, for weeks at a time. The amount of time lost to work and to school uh, from somebody who has this is much more prolonged uh, than somebody who had a typical case of bacterial pneumonia. It took me a good six months to feel reasonable afterwards. They did x-rays and they found a, a shadow there and it turned out to be what's called a granuloma. Uh, and the granuloma is just a calcified lump about or half an inch in diameter. Unless his immune system gets compromised, he'll likely never have symptoms again but there is no cure. That ball of fungus spherules will be in his lung forever. There were four Americans in New Zealand at the competition, and they said, oh, you've appealed with valley fever. And I said, oh, I don't think so. It just feels like the flu. And I went back to Australia, and they said, yeah, you've had the flu. We'll give you some antibiotics. Malcolm's friends were correct, and his doctors were wrong. 
It highlights the mystery and misdiagnosis of valley fever, a little known disease with symptoms that appear to be better known ailments like bacterial pneumonia, tuberculosis, <laughs> the common flu, and even cancer. I felt really weak and I couldn't even like step on one foot. This is so hard. Nine-year-old Emily Garaspi's brush with valley fever in 2012 began with a diagnosis of bacterial pneumonia. It was the very first weekend of May and she woke up from her sleep just not feeling good and she described it as her stomach not feeling well and then she was just really tired that weekend and that whole week and she had a cough that wouldn't go away. Valley fever is very common around here, and I knew that with her fatigue, with the cough, with the rash, that we probably were looking at valley fever, but no doctor would say that. When we took her back again, finally, there was a doctor that said, this isn't pneumonia, but he knew just by looking at the spot on the x-ray, he recognized it right away that it was valley fever. Valley fever was first discovered in Buenos Aires in the late 1800s and then a few years later in the San Joaquin Valley. In 1938, researcher Ernest Dixon made the connection between the fungal disease and what was then a mystery illness impacting people in Central and Southern California. In the 1940s, more than a quarter million soldiers in the Western Flying Training Command were tested as part of a study, leading to much of what is known about the disease today. I kept on asking my mom, why did Valley Fever pick me? And she didn't know the answer. I guess it just, I breathe and it just went in my lungs. Emily and Malcolm fall into that 40% of people who come down with symptoms, but are able to keep the fungus in check in their lungs. But for others, the coxy fungus does not stay put. It can spread to other parts of the body, causing everything from skin lesions to serious joint pain or worse. And if it spreads, particularly if it spreads to the brain or the meninges that cover around the brain, uh, then that is a disease that is going to have huge consequences for that person uh, for their entire life. I like to say, come speak to me. I got a story for you. I literally felt like I was actually dying. And for someone who's never had any health problems, I've never felt that being, feeling of being so sick. But I was pretty sure whatever this is, it's not pneumonia and I am dying. Gina Piner didn't know it at the time, but while she was treated for bacterial pneumonia, the valley fever fungal spores were ravaging her body. She did know something was very wrong. I asked my family member to take me to the emergency room again. And when I went, I whispered to her, make them do a chest CT, which is a CAT scan of your chest. Make them do an MRI of my brain, knowing I work in the medical field, so I just knew what they needed to do, but they weren't doing it. And I said, make them. And I said, if you have to scream at them and yell at them, and you have to be me and I don't care, do it and make them invent me. Gina had what's known as coxy meningitis. The fungus had spread to her brain. For an unlucky three to 5% of valley fever victims, the spores spread or disseminate to various parts of the body. The results can be debilitating or deadly. It has disseminated all through your body. Your bones, it's in your bones. It's, it's created blockages in your spine and your spinal cord. Um, it's uh, in your behind in your ears, and, you're, and they said to me, um, it's also behind your eye sockets, and you have about hundreds of hemorrhages in your eyes right now, and you will be going blind unless we can stop it. They had the the treatments that they gave her, and for some reason they were always scheduled late at night, and mm. they and you know I don't even remember yeah, what the heck it was. It was the most evil stuff I've ever seen. That evil stuff was the powerful antifungal medicine amphotericin B, injected directly into the brain. When they injected it, immediately after, your whole, my whole body is just shaking, like 
it was tremors, just uncontrollably. And you just start burning up. You feel like you're actually in a fire. And it was, it was horrible. And I was begging for help and there's nothing they could do to even relieve those things. You don't really think in depth what she's going through until you've actually seen you know, her in person or see her in the bed and see that she's got her shades on because the lights are bothering her and, and she, her so much swelling in her brain that she's seeing things, you know, it's, it's sad and it's scary. Yeah, but especially with her personality so spunky yeah. and, and festive and crazy and then just to see her just barely being able to walk and it's hard. I had a radiologist tell me, get ready to tell your friend goodbye and oh gosh. Uh, that he had never seen a case so severe. So... And you are in the medical field. Yes. So when someone tells you that, you take it seriously. Yes. But valley fever in its early stages isn't always taken seriously. Even in communities in Arizona or California's San Joaquin Valley, where the fungus is found throughout the soil. What they've heard is, oh, it's just like the flu and your immune system can fight it unless your immune system is low. That's not always the case. There are very healthy people who get it and can't fight it off. Kathy Terrell's brother Max was a healthy, active 56-year-old who contracted valley fever. It was misdiagnosed as tuberculosis and spread throughout his body. He died five months later. It's horrible to watch. I would not wish it on Osama bin Laden himself if he were alive. I would not wish this disease on anyone. It's that bad. It's that bad. For those few people that are going to get severe illness, um, the faster they get the correct diagnosis, they have the better chance of having um, a better recovery rather than a prolonged recovery if it takes two or three months to get the diagnosis. Unfortunately, a, a lot of those patients are misdiagnosed for months with bacterial pneumonia or other causes of pulmonary disease before coxie is considered the etiology of their symptoms. And by then, they're referred to infectious disease or one of the pulmonary specialists and treated for coxie. Misdiagnosis is just one of the challenges of valley fever. Because people respond so differently to the disease and antifungal drugs can have negative side effects, there's actually disagreement on treatment. We treat basically almost everyone, whereas in Arizona they're more selective. They try and look for people that seem to have risk factors for doing poorly before they initi initiate therapy. Um, we don't have data that proves whose approach is actually best. We don't even know if early treatment alters the course. Um, we've long speculated that, but it's never been proven in a randomized trial the way we know that bacterial pneumonia responds to antibiotics, patients get better faster. Um, for coxie, some people think that early treatment actually may alter the immune response enough that symptoms are, are prolonged. I'm half Filipino. My dad was born and raised in the Philippines and moved to Chicago, met my mother, they got married and had me. One thing valley fever experts do know, people like Jerry Galang are more likely to get a worse case of valley fever. The disease attacks non-Caucasians, especially Filipinos, at a much higher rate. I was doing some yard work with uh, using a bobcat, moving dirt, and so I was covered with dust in Simi Valley, California, uh, for about two days, and three weeks later, I was attending a uh, computer class in Irvine, and all of a sudden I was getting stabbing pains in my chest, like someone sticking a knife in with every breath I took. It's sort of what we call the innate immune response, and that's a pre-programmed um, immune response. And, and what that pre-programmed means is it's not something you've been vaccinated, it's not something your body has ever even seen before, but it's the way your body deals with new exposures. Um, and we found that that's, that's quite different for different people. Um, and that's probably a product of what historically entire ethnicities were exposed to. Today, Jerry is in San Diego visiting Robin Smith. Robin is also a valley fever survivor. I was in a coma for 10 days, not expected to survive. Uh, the doctors, of course, didn't communicate that directly, but it was later told to us that uh, my odds of survival were one-tenth of one percent. Coxie meningitis nearly claimed his life and took away the use of his legs. 
Today, Robin is a coordinator of disabilities for the San Diego Padres. I was so proud of, <laughs> of uh, Robin. <laughs> Robin. And there's another thing that affected me is my brain is a lot of dead spots in there and I get a loss for words. But I was applauding Robin on his ability to get past it and get a job and, and be a productive citizen. In my case, I lost so many brain cells, the field I was in, I was not able to go back to work. I, I sat at that computer and it's gone. It truly is gone. Before you meet someone and even before you read stories online, you know, you think this is, why, why me? Why am I suffering so much? And then you read about other people's, uh, how it's affected them and you go, Wow, it's, I'm not that bad. <laughs> One of the things that, that I've found is that that can be such an isolating experience to, to have a diagnosis like valley fever. And like Jerry says, it's almost like a, you're bobbing on the ocean. You're, the, you're that little speck in the middle of a sea of blue that, that feels very, very isolated. Valley Fever survivors like Robin and Jerry and many others around the world turned to a website and group started by a Washington State survivor and her son. It's a lifeline for people looking for answers about the mysterious disease. 99% of them have the disease and the other 1% are husbands and wives or mothers or daughters of people who have the disease. And I encourage them to educate themselves. When they go into a doctor's office, they have to know more than the doctor about this disease. Trust his overall medical experience and his medical education. But where this disease is concerned, don't let him brush you off or her brush you off and tell you to go home and call, you, call him if you get worse. Sharon Garrett and other survivors have turned into advocates for valley fever awareness. Their concern, a lack of awareness in the medical community, leads to so many misdiagnoses. I'd like to see it mandatory for doctors to have an official Valley Fever training. Um, I'd like to see um, a protocol for symptoms when they're presented to clinics and, and hospitals and doctor's offices. It is surprising uh, that with it being so common uh, in this part of the world that still diagnosis gets missed oftentimes for weeks and people go through a great deal uh, of bad experience with pneumonia, fatigue, fever without having an answer. Attention and research funding given to valley fever pales in comparison to other high profile diseases. From 1999 to 2012, over a 13 year span, there were about 37,000 West Nile virus cases, but in one year alone, 2011, there were 22,000 reported cases of valley fever, almost two-thirds as many. Despite that, the National Institutes of Health funding for valley fever research is just 4% of West Nile. We see significant spikes in funding, uh, grant funding, uh, with many of our emerging pathogens that we see. Uh, we do not see that with valley fever at all. I think for anybody whose family or themselves are afflicted with an uncommon illness and it doesn't look like much is being done, uh, it's natural to say, hey, what about us? Uh, other, other conditions seem to have work done on them. Why, why is this one not getting the attention it deserves? I get that. I think any disease that affects part of the country uh, and that's been around for a long time has the, the unfortunate fact that it may not get the attention it needs and deserves. It's not that the drug companies won't do it and won't be interested, but they all say, show me, uh, show me the proof, show me a sick human who you've helped. David Larwood, the CEO of Valley Fever Solutions, says hope could be on the horizon. Researchers may be on the cusp of a cure a drug called nicomycin Z. Experiments in the 1980s showed promise, but stopped when the pharmaceutical company went out of business. Larwood's company is trying to raise money for human trials. But support for our effort has been very, very limited, so the several million dollars that we need to simply make the drug has been a challenge. And so we need a million dollars to make the drug, and then we need another couple million dollars to do the trials. Uh, 
uh, we don't have it. And we're looking all sorts of places, philanthropic, government. Because there is no cure, patients who have survived valley fever end up regularly taking antifungal medications to prevent it from spreading again. I say it swelled like a watermelon. The coxie fungus attacked Jack Miller's ankle in 2004. I mean, it was very large because as it's set up inside my ankle, it's just breeding or it's multiplying or doing whatever it's doing, but it's not going anywhere and it's staying right there. Jack didn't even live in the endemic valley fever area when he caught the disease. Turns out he breathed in the spores while simply driving through the San Joaquin Valley. Yeah, I would come down Monday night from Susanville, go ahead and jump in my truck, go ahead and make my run, lay over in San Diego, come back, make my run. So just, you know, window halfway cracked or whatever, you can't filter out a spore. You know, if it was gonna go ahead and get up in the air and find its way to, to my nose or nostrils, you know. A decade after that fateful breath in the cab of his truck, Jack now drives 1,700 miles round trip from Idaho to UC Davis Medical Center several times each year for treatment. He'll take antifungal medication for the rest of his life. I'm fortunate that my employer covers the cost of my medicine because uh, right now I think it's about $3,500, $4,000 a month. The medicine I'm on to go ahead and just keep it squashed. While thousands wait for a cure, valley fever has continued to take a toll on the Central Valley. In 2001, 23 Navy SEALs were training near Colinga, California, not far from that model airplane competition. Several started getting sick. A Naval Medical Center study confirmed an outbreak. 45% of the SEALs tested positive for valley fever. All it takes is one breath. My guess would be if you took the 20 years we've been flying here, just, this is just off the top of my head, there's probably half a dozen people who may have got it relatively seriously that required you know, some, some form of serious medical attention. Uh, there are one or two people who have been told by their doctor never to come back. Competitors bringing their models to Lost Hills are forewarned, but what about people who don't have a choice? Valley fever is also running rampant here, inside some of California's San Joaquin Valley prisons. The disease has been blamed for the deaths of dozens of prisoners and even prison staff. The state spends about $23 million a year caring for prisoners with valley fever. Patients who are inmates who, are, who have diabetes, whose race is Filipinos and African Americans, they have to be moved out of the uh, of this area which has coxie, okay? And also those patients who we categorize as high risk will be moved out also. In World War II, German prisoners were even transferred out of the area to avoid violating the Geneva Conventions governing prisoner treatment. Because the Nazis invoked the Geneva Convention that they were being exposed to this disease as cruel and, pu and unusual punishment. And so the Nazis were moved. Nazis! Despite their anger over the lack of awareness and current treatment, some survivors do see signs of hope. In late 2013, experts from across the U.S. attended a symposium in Bakersfield organized by Congressman Kevin McCarthy, alarmed by the recent spike in valley fever cases. I had an uncle. It went to his bones. I have a mother-in-law who got it late just a couple years ago. She was bedridden for more than six months. Even my own mother, I remember being called back where she had a, um, an x-ray in her lungs and the doctor called her back th thinking she had cancer and we all went down, found it a day or two later. No, it was valley, a scar from valley fever as a child here. When I got valley fever, I got really weak. After I was feeling better, I went to the doctor. The little ball in my lungs is smaller now, and now I stand grateful. Thank you for your time. Emily Garaspi was there sharing her story. Also there, the directors of the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control, promising a new research study. 
There are a lot of unanswered questions in Valley Fever, and that's a real concern. That's why it's so gratifying and important that we see such collaboration here within California as well as with Arizona. My dream would be that if you walk in the door with pneumonia or even just with fever for a couple of days, you're not quite sure what it is, that there's a simple, inexpensive test that will say, okay, you got valley fever, you don't. We don't have that right now. Until there's a medical breakthrough, there's little that can be done to eliminate this danger in the dust. For its victims, its survivors, and their loved ones, it's about waiting, hoping, and warning others. I call this my really slow, near-death experience. People, it usually happens in a flash, and mine is spread out over decades. So, yeah, I feel like it's stolen my life. It scares me to death, it really does. If you breathe, you're susceptible to valley fever. It's essentially what it comes down to. To order a copy of this program, visit us online or call 1-888-814-3923. This Viewfinder episode is supported by UC Davis Health System. At UC Davis, the lives we touch inspire us. 